to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ and now abide faith hope and love but the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 13. We welcome you to our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. And today we're going to be studying chapters 13 and 14 as Paul is going to discuss a greater way than the miraculous and that way being love. And he's also going to give us some great principles about miracles that we'll learn in this text as well. And so we want to encourage you to have your Bible handy, locate that and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together in our study today. Friend, we want you to know we're so happy that you've joined us for our broadcast today. And we want you to know that this lesson is being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church in your area. The Church of Christ would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about what the Church of Christ is or teaches or uh, would just like to learn about it, friend, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you. You'll find people there who love God, who love His Word, and who are concerned about lost souls. And friend, we want you to know that's our motive in bringing these lessons today as well. At the Gospel of Christ, we are, our main emphasis is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we're concerned first and foremost about men and women going to heaven. With that in mind, we encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We've got a good variety of Bible study tools that we make available to you free of charge. We have uh, transcripts, we've got audio lessons, video lessons, study questions, just great audio and video tools that will aid you in your Bible study. And friend, they're all free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on audio or video or any of our previous lessons, we make those available to you free of charge. We'll even pay the postage to get those to you, or you can download them free of charge from our website as well. And friend, we make available in today's world apps for both the Android and Apple phone, iPhone, and those are available from the correlating app stores as well, and we hope that you'll check those out also. Today we're going to be studying about one of the most beautiful and uplifting subjects of all time, and that is the subject of love. But before we study what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, let's get the background as to why Paul is saying this. There's problems in the church of Corinth, which we have discussed in our previous lessons, and Paul is addressing these uh, in detail throughout 1 Corinthians. Chapter 11, he dealt with problems related to the Lord's Supper, and in chapter 12, he has begun to address problems related to the miraculous and, and how it seems people are getting so caught up in the miraculous that they're missing something far better. Friend, there's something greater than miracles. And that's what Paul is going to discuss here. Notice the background to this. Why does Paul talk about love? Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 31. Paul says, but earnestly, he talked about all these gifts, and then he says, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Well, what in the world would be a more excellent way than having all these <clears throat> spiritual gifts that people could use uh, to help the church. Well, friend, that more excellent way is love. Hebrews 13, 1. Let brotherly love continue. John 13, verse 34 and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. What do you mean new? It wasn't new to love. The Old Testament taught, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus wanted that to be premier 
to be for, at the forefront in everything the disciples did. And to the church in Corinth, He wants them to see a better way than getting caught up in all these miracles. And that better way is love. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, as Paul is going to show us why love and what love is better than. Look in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verses 1 through 3. Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Friend, in everything we do as a Christian, if love is not the reason we do it, Paul basically said, all of that is worthless if your motivation is not love. Now, let's notice specifically what we mean or what Paul addresses by that. Paul says, eloquence without love is worthless. He says in, in, in verse number one, though I can speak with the tongues of men and angels, though the apostle Paul could stand up and deliver the most riveting sermon you could ever imagine, if his motive for doing that was not out of love, Paul says, it's worthless. If he had the eloquence of Apollos, but he didn't do it in love, that sermon was a waste of time. Isn't that basically what Ephesians 4.15 says? Speak the truth in love. And so the greatest oration without love as the motivation is a waste of time. Secondly, Paul says, the miraculous without love is worthless. Uh, again, notice verse number two. I've got, though I've got the gift of prophecy, though I understand all knowledge and have all faith, Yet if I do not have love, it's worthless. If Paul could prophesy, but the reason he prophesied was kind of like Balaam, because he had to, that'd be worthless. If Paul had all understanding of all mystery, all miraculous understanding of all mystery and knowledge, a miraculous measure of faith, but it didn't have love with that, it'd be worthless. Friend, the miraculous without love has no power at all. And then Paul mentions, thirdly, not only is eloquence without love worthless, not only is the miraculous without love worthless, but self-sacrifice without love is also worthless. Paul says, though I give my body, verse number three, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned, I do not have love. It's worthless. Friend, there's no doubt that Christianity is about self-sacrifice, right? Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself. There's self-sacrifice. Deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What if you gave everything you had to feed the poor? What if you, like maybe we read of in Fox's Book of Martyrs, like the great Polycarp, you gave your body to be burned at the stake? But you didn't do it for love. You did it for pride or you did it so others could look at you, or you did it for your own glory and praise. Friend, that would have been the most, most worthless act in the history of the world. Why? You didn't do it out of love. And so Paul begins by showing us that if love is not the motivation in everything we do, then friend, everything we do is worthless because of that. And friend, we want you especially to hear this. Our motivation today, as we mentioned from the outset, is out of love. We want you to know two things from the outset. We want you to know more than anything that God loves you deeply. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son for you, John 3, 16, and for me. And friend, our reason, our motivation in giving these lessons is because we love you and we want you to go to heaven. We're not, we're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about your money. We're not concerned about fame and glory or any of those other things. We love souls, and we're concerned about people going to heaven. Now, let's then notice 
what true love is. You know, we hear those words, true love. What is true love? Uh, you know, some little kid writes on a sixth grade English folder, I love so-and-so. Well, is that real love? What are we talking about? What are the characteristics of love? Notice 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. Love, no doubt, love is a feeling, but love is a whole lot more than just a feeling. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Friend, as we think about love, love is a whole lot more than that puppy love feeling that we often think about. Don't get me wrong. There's no doubt love is a strong emotion, but love is also combined with intellect, attitude, and action. You see, love suffers long with people. That is, love's willing to give people a chance. Love is kindness in action, is it not? <clears throat> if I love someone, I'm not going to be evil or angry or mean to them. That's not true love. Love is not jealous. Jealousy has no place in love. If I truly love someone, then I trust them. And I'm not envious of, of them or their abilities or talents or, or jealous in that way. Love's not about self. L love is not out putting on a parade for itself, saying, look at me, look at how good I am, look at all the things I can do. It's not puffed up and it's not prideful. That's not love. Love doesn't act in a, a rude way. You ever known anybody that was rude? And then that person say, but I love you. My well, friend, love does not behave rudely. And I'm not saying from time to time we might, you know, have some of these things in our life that are not right. That's not what we're saying. But as a habitual practice, that's not love. It's not out to seek its own thing. Uh, it's not easily provoked. Love doesn't think evil. I can't say I love you if I'm out thinking evil about you. Love is not happy about That's not love. I'm not rejoicing in sin if I love someone. Rather, I rejoice in the truth. And listen to this beautiful statement. What's real love? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love is out thinking the best, trying to do the best, trying to promote the best, and in every way be the best that it can be for other people. The Scripture, though, clearly teaches in 1 Corinthians 13 in discussing how love is greater than the miraculous, the Scripture also gets back to the idea of the miraculous by showing us that the miraculous, as powerful and as good as it was for its purpose, had a specific end in sight. And by that we mean this. Miracles were never intended to be for everybody and to last forever. That This text in 1 Corinthians 13 is going to teach that. Now, before we get into that, I want you to hear me well on what we're saying. So you're saying God's dead today. Of course not. We're not saying God's dead. God is alive, well, ruling and reigning in heaven. He still rules in the kingdoms of men, Daniel chapter 5. Uh, we're not saying that God is powerless. We believe in the power of God. We pray that God will, through His providential means, help us, no doubt. And there's great power in prayer. But we're also saying that God works in providential ways, not in the miraculous ways today. Now, let me illustrate that a little further. Let's talk about, for just a moment, what is a Bible miracle? Sometimes people use the word, that was a miracle. They say, uh, a baby being born, uh, birth is a miracle. Well... That's not the way the word miracle is used in the Bible. That's awesome. That's amazing. That's proof of God. But a miracle in the Bible is different than using it that way. Let me illustrate. Um, what was a Bible miracle? Raising a dead person who'd been dead for four days, five days, four or five days. That's a Bible miracle. 
John chapter 11, Jesus came to the town of Mary and Martha and they got upset because they said, if you'd have been here, our brother wouldn't have died. He has passed on and he's been dead for several days now. And, and Jesus said, where's the tomb? I want to go see him. And they said, he's been dead four or five days. Surely he stinks by now. In John chapter 11, to a man, for, for a man that had been dead many days, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth bound with grave clothes, a man who'd been dead without life for many days. That's a Bible miracle. A Bible miracle would be healing a lame man, like in Acts chapter 3. Uh, Peter and John saw a lame man outside Solomon's porch, and that lame man, as was his custom, when someone came by, asked for alms. And Peter said, Silver and gold have we none, but what we do have we give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, <clears throat> arise and walk. And that man who had been lame stood up and leaped and ran like a deer, as it were. A lame man like that being healed and walking is a Bible miracle. John chapter 9, give you another example. A man who was born blind and couldn't see, Jesus instantaneously gave that man sight. And the man and his parents, and, and that was the miracle that would pretty much push Jesus. You're either going to accept Jesus as Lord or you're going to kill him. That miracle was ungetoverable. Why? Uh, a man who had never seen a day in his life automatically able to see perfectly. That's a Bible miracle. Bible miracles were immediate, undeniable, and not for physical gratification. How do we know that? Listen to, and we want you to, I want to, I want you to hear this real well. In the Bible, miracles were never for physical gratification alone. That is, miracles, don't misunderstand what we're saying here. Miracles were not just to make people feel better in the Bible. How do we know that? 2 Timothy 4 verse 20, Paul who had the miraculous said, Epaphras, I've left in Melita sick. What? If you could heal him, why didn't you do it? You left him in Melita sick. You've got the Holy Spirit. You can do miracles. Why didn't you heal him? Well, friend, that wasn't, they weren't for physical gratification alone. Miracles weren't just to get people better. I know that kind of sounds so different than what you see today, but miracles had a bigger purpose. Let's talk about that purpose before we look at 1 Corinthians 13. What's the purpose of miracles? I want you to look in your Bible in Mark chapter 16. Let's ask that question from the Scripture. Why did God allow people to do miracles in the Bible? Look in Mark chapter 16 and we see God's answer to that question. If they're not for physical gratification, just to make people feel better and well, what were they all about? Look in Mark chapter 16 verse 20. Talking to the disciples, the Bible says, and they went out, the disciples went out, and preached everywhere, listen to this now, and the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. That exact idea is also taught in Hebrews 2 verses 3 and 4, that God was working, confirming their word through the signs. Now, let's imagine that. Let's use our imagination for just a moment and imagine that we're in the first century. Let's say that we're living in the days of the first century when the message of God and of Christ is still being revealed. You don't have a written New Testament that you can pick up and check when somebody says something. And so imagine you've got two speakers, okay? Two people stand up and say, I've got a message from God about Christ. Those messages are diametrically opposed to each other. How are you going to know which one's right? Well, this man just cast out an unclean spirit. Everybody saw it. This man just healed the sick. This man just raised the dead. This fellow over here, well, he's still standing over there doing nothing. A miracle was that, like a big blinking sign saying, this man is my spokesman. The miracle confirmed. It was absolute proof. He's a spokesman from God. You need to listen to him. And so we want to think about then how long that was to last. And as we said, 1 Corinthians 13 teaches us. I want you to look in 1 Corinthians 13 and let's notice the timing on when miracles would end. 1 Corinthians 13, look at verses 8 through 10. The Bible says, and again, beginning with the idea of love, love never fails. Now he's going to go back to the miraculous. But where there are prophecies, they'll fail. Whether there are tongues, they'll cease. Whether there is knowledge, and the idea of miraculous knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part 
and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. There's no doubt that the partial here is the miraculous. It's that which is going to cease, going to stop, not going to go on any further. It's the partial. And so that which is in part is going to be done away with. When? When that which is perfect comes. Friend, the Lord has already come and gone <clears throat> by this time, so we're not talking about His original coming. Anytime the second coming of Christ is spoken about, it is comes again. Uh, what else is going to come that these Christians would uh, be looking forward or have the privilege to see? The only other item that this word perfect is used to relate to that was still coming was the Word of God. And friend, that's what was being revealed and that's what the purpose of miracles was to get us up to. Being said, here's the whole purpose of what we're saying. Here's the whole point of it. Miracles were to get the early church to the point, to know God's truth to the point that they had the complete revealed will of God. When did that occur? Toward the end of the New Testament. James 1.25, James said, we have the perfect law of liberty. Christians received the revelation of God toward the end of the first century. It was described as the complete or perfect law of liberty. And the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 13, when that which is perfect comes, the partial be done away with. They received God's complete revelation and we have that today. And friend, please misunderstand, don't misunderstand. Were miracles amazing? Were they wonderful? Absolutely. Friend, we can confirm God's Word today by the Bible. That's why He gave it to us. So what about all these people who are out claiming to do miracles today? Friend, I want to say this as, as kindly yet as pointedly as I can say it. If people have the ability to do miracles today, I want you to listen real, real carefully to this, okay? If people have the ability to do miraculous today, I'm talking about Bible miracles, like they could do in the first century, and as you will often see, and as they are purported to be for physical gratification, if people have that, and it's as they claim for physical gratification today, and those people don't go to St. Jude's Hospital and heal every child in there, then they're some of the sorriest people to ever walk the face of the earth. And I mean that as kindly and as nicely as I can. The Bible teaches Miracles were real. Don't misunderstand that. The Bible teaches miracles had a specific purpose. The Bible teaches they were to confirm the Word. But the Bible also teaches the miracles like you read about in the New Testament are not happening today. Why are people not being raised from the dead? Why are blind people not seeing? Why, why do you not have a man who's got a withered hand all drawn up and he's never used it all his life and somebody healed that today? Because those miracles had a specific purpose and a specific end in sight. And men and women don't have that ability today because it was for a specific purpose. Now, we say that in love, we say that in kindness, and again, the main thing is not miracles. The main thing is love. Now, remember these words. Now, abide faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Friend, God's love, Christians' love for each other, the love of the New Testament church, the love of the Scriptures, far more powerful than any miracle could ever imagine to be. And so as we think about miracles, there's some other things to notice also. We learn especially about tongue speaking in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and there is some very important teaching that we want to mention here. A lot of times we'll hear or see people do tongue speaking. Of course, that would have been one of the miracles that would have ended in the first century as well. But a lot of people claim they can still do that. But they leave out some of the teachings in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And one of them specifically is that tongue speaking wasn't just some heavenly language. Tongue speaking was actually speaking in a known language of the day that you had never studied, but that other people who might speak that language could understand. And you never spoke in tongues unless there was an interpreter there. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, verses 27 and 28. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or three at the most, each in turn, and let one interpret. Now listen to this. But if there is no interpreter... Let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Sometimes when we see about tongue speaking, you'll, there'll be this 
this, this tongue speaking supposedly, and nobody ever knows what it meant. And how are we going to know what it means? How can I know if you're saying what you think it is is what it means? Well, friend, tongue speaking was a known language somebody would never studied and that other people would know. And there was always an interpreter there, so it wasn't just some heavenly Bible. That's not the idea. But here's another teaching. You know, sometimes when you see the miraculous, it's as though it takes over people and controls them and there's nothing they can do about it. Friend, I don't know how to say it but to say it, but that's just not the way it is in the Bible. Uh, when the Holy Spirit worked with people, their spirit was always, uh, they had the ability to control that, meaning that the spirit of the prophet was always subject to the prophet. Listen to these words, 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 32. The Bible says this, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That, that idea teaches us that it never controlled you, that it never overtook you. Uh, your spirit was still there and controlling. It didn't just overtake you and something not happen. And so why does Paul mention all this about controlling and using the miraculous properly? Because God doesn't want chaos and confusion. God doesn't want people jumping over pews or babbling what they claim was some heavenly language when nobody in the world knows what they're saying. What does God want? Listen to 1 Corinthians 14, 33. The Bible says this, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And then verse 40, That all things be done decently and in order. Now friend, we know that some of the things we mentioned today may be different than what you've thought of or uh, heard about uh, miracles in the Bible. All we ask is that you open your Bible and study for yourself. That you'll check these things and if they're true, Accept them because the Word of God teaches that. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. Uh, as we mentioned from the outset of our lesson, the main thing is not miracles. The main thing is love. And friend, we want you to know God loves you. He wants you to be saved. We love you and we want you to be saved. If there's any way we can help you in your study of the Word of God, don't hesitate to call us, to write us, contact us. We'd be happy to help you in your study of the Word of God. And more than anything, friend, we want you to know, we want you to go to heaven. We want to one day stand in heaven with all the redeemed of the ages and praise God for eternity. And we hope and pray that you'll be there. Join us next time as we study the Word of God together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.